this presentation is from please pardon me again if I get your name wrong. <laughs> but I'm gonna try. Ntanda. There you go. <laughs> Alright, so let's all come here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ntanda Mandui. I am from Malawi, Southeast Africa. I am an entrepreneur and I'm an MBA student here with the Broad College of Business. I'm in my first year. I'm the founder of the Pathway Collective, which was initially called Dental Foundation, and also the founder of a platform called Digital Skills for Africa, where we try to teach young people um, digital and e-learning skills. Um, so, first of all, happy spring. I wanted to know how many of you know about the Holland Tulip Festival? Okay, how many of you have been? Haven't been yet? All right. How many of you know what is here? Yes, specifically? This is a live feed of um, the festival, where the festival is hosted. So you can actually monitor the tulips how they're doing, because one of the biggest hurdles people found was that when you try to go to Holland, the tulips might not be cooperating or they might not be great. So this is a 24-7 live feed of the tulips, where you can control the camera from anywhere in the world and get to see how the tulips are doing today. Now, flip that, and I am a Malawian, and we're organizing an innovation conference, and one of our biggest struggles is trying to get live streaming for the conference. This is bringing you to the digital divide. We have the West live streaming tulips in the field as we are failing to stream our futures. In 2021, um, my foundation, the Quattro Collective, was awarded a quarter million dollars by the World Bank to um, train young people in digital skills. So we set up tech hubs. Um, these are the pictures from tech hubs. And I think this is the pandemic, the mass. So we had um, um, two tech hubs set up in Malawi and we were tasked to train 500 young people in digital skills. We were supposed to set up one tech hub, but we set up two because of our focus regions in Malawi. One being in the capital city because they thought that I needed mentorship doing this for the first time. And the other one being in my hometown, so we set up the two. And we trained 641 students, so ideally we ended up succeeding. And since then, because we have an e-learning system, we've managed to train almost 10,000 um, learners in this space. Um, so like I've said, DSA is an e-learning platform. We offer a wide range of courses. By the way, I'm an economist by um, uh, background training. And when I finished my um, undergrad, I wanted to digitize Malawi. So I grew up, my, my father is a marine engineer, my mother was a marine captain, so I grew up by the shores of Lake Malawi. And my perception of Malawi was Malawi is very gorgeous, it's beautiful, you have the beautiful hotels. Now you get online and you Google, um, what you find is Malawi is poor, corruption, all the bad stuff. And I said, where are our stories? Why are we not telling our stories? So I started uh, blogging and that's when um, I started to share more about Malawi and a lot of more young people wanted to get in the same space. So that's where the birth of the, uh, the collective came about, where we wanted to train more young people. Or let me say, I wanted more people to be sharing stories. But before they even shared the stories, I realized they didn't have the basic digital skills to be able to do this, which is why we set up this um, idea. So first was the e-learning, because before I was like, I'll write a book, I said, but a book is not enough because digital skills are constantly evolving. So I said, okay, let's do an e-learning system. We just happened to be really, really lucky that at the time that I was setting this up, the World Bank had also come into Malawi. And they had a program where they said, we also want to do exactly the same. And at the time, by the way, let me just give you an idea. I was working for the Revenue Authority as a tax collector. And I was earning, you can say, net about $300 a month. And then the World Bank comes and they say, oh, do you want to take a quarter million dollars and set up a tech hub? I said, how? I, <laughs> how am I going to do it? You know, but at the time, I think my best friend said, you can do it. So we set up the tech hubs. It was a huge learning curve for me. So we have like the courses which are mostly free because one of the things in Africa is price elasticities. I don't know, it's like the worst kind where you s turn it from zero dollars to a dollar and you've lost the entire market. So we try to subsidize our courses to make sure people can afford our courses. Um, now we obviously, as I've said, do not do this alone. We have a lot of partners. So the World Bank is our biggest funder. The EU has given us almost close to 100,000 euros. Um, GIZ is also one of our big partners. So to this end, we've raised about uh, half a million dollars. This all sounds great, but there was never a baseline study done for any of this. So all this money came into Malawi, there was no context about what actually would work in Malawi. So I got the funding. We've done a lot of successful projects, but there was nothing that we were really mapping to say what works in Malawi. So at the end of the project, we got a quarter million dollars, we train all these young people, 
one of the key measures was that we must be sustainable at the end of this project. And they came back and they said, why are you still not yet sustainable? And I did not always have the answers because I said, I don't know. You know, we're all there, we're evaluating, and I'm like, I don't know why not sustainable. I don't know why the kids that we trained, the wonderful kids, did not come back to the hub um, to learn what we did. So that's why I took on the thesis, and I immediately um, enrolled myself in a master's degree, my first master's at the Malawi University of Science and Technology. And I wanted to um, kind of analyze what it means to create systems, but also for those systems to be uptaken by the market in my country. So this is where the thesis came about. So the biggest problem was, like I said, where are our stories? Why are we not telling our own African stories? Why are our stories being told by us? And I, I love the research that you guys are doing because I think we think about it. Um, usually people talk about the savior mentality or the white saviors, and it's usually said in criticism. But actually what happens is, uh, and I've had my black friends come to Malawi, because they work in development work, where they go is not the Malawi that I know. So because if they're working in poverty, if you're working in uh, maybe helping children, Ideally, your frame of Africa is going to be narrowed down to that of an Africa that is suffering, because just by the nature of your work, that's the Africa that you get to see. You don't get to the rest of it, which is why I said, let's try to build a system where Africans can be empowered to tell their own stories. Brings me to my study. At the time that I did the study, which was 2021, of course, published this year, um, Africa only had a 1% share of the digital economy. The cost of data, it has gone down a lot by now, I believe, but at the time, almost 10% of um, a person's income went into just buying data. And another one was 27% of Africans had access to the internet. I believe there's been a lot of programs and efforts, so we're trying to close this gap. Speaking of the digital divide, which is what I'm just speaking about, most of African countries are still at the digitization stage, which is transitioning from analog, paper-based reporting to just get them to even open their emails. When I'm back in Malawi, I'm always frustrated because I'm like, please just open your computer. Please just read your email. So we're still down here. And I think you must agree, if we're talking about America, we're way beyond digital transformation. Now we're talking about AI and we're moving in that direction. So now the question is, when we're talking about the digital divide, where is Africa and how are we going to move forward? Now we can't move forward without models. There are models that have been tried. But one of the biggest concerns I have is, this is the model that I studied in 2021. This model was developed in 1990. That's when people started doing this research and trying to see what's gonna work in digitization. Africa was still at the very beginning. So we're still in 1990. That's our big problem. So this is the um, technology, organizational, environmental, and individual framework developed in 1990 by a few researchers. Um, it's mostly for um, technology adoption, but what I did was I modeled it on both creation and adoption because I thought we still had and needed both. So it, uh, the variables are innovativeness, IT ability, your IT experience, and those are categorized as individual factors, the individual creating the system or uptaking the system. And then we have technology readiness and firm size. These are categorized as organizational factors. Then when you talk about um, perceived benefits, compatibility, and costs, those are technological factors. And then we have consumer pressure, competitor pressure, and external support, and these are environmental um, factors. So this was what we were analyzing. And for the methodology, uh, Malawi had a population at the time of about 20 million. So with the Slovens formula, um, it told me that I needed about 400 respondents. So I was actually here in the US working with the United Nations in New York. So most of my data collection was actually done online. Um, people were able to respond through emails and um, contact the schools. Uh, I contacted the schools directly, and they gave me students who were able to give me data. So we had 461 respondents. And we did a logistic model, which was this, and it was modeled on two variables, um, two um, dependent variables, which was IMS creation and IMS adoption. And this were my findings. First, we ran the regression, I think, um, two times for IMS creation and then for IMS adoption. And these were the significant variables. Um, so this is IMS creation, and we have IMS adoption. We had three um, um, significant here, but we reduced that model down, and we did an odds ratio. So when we get to the odds ratio, that's when we see the variables that actually were very significant. So we have IMS adoption, and the variable that was significant for um, IMS adoption, what really influences um, people to be able, especially in 2021 at the time, um, to uptake a system was their perceived benefits. What can I get from this system? Now for the creators, they had different variables. Innovativeness was very significant across board. Competitive pressure and cost were also very significant. So I just highlight and try to visualize the same model here, um, which is that under the individual factors for IMS creation, we had innovativeness. We had one technological factor, cost, and we had competitive pressure as um, also a uh, significant factor um, under environmental factors for IMS creation. For IMS adoption, the rest are not really significant, only perceived benefits was actually very significant. 
I think this was very important because when we're creating the systems and when we're creating solutions for Africa, we must understand what we're doing. I want to kind of make a call to you guys as researchers. One of the things we don't do is publish um, as African researchers. So when I was doing this study, I literally had almost no data to work with in Malawi. And I want to make a call to you to publish. And I just want to share with you, you can access my thesis. And there is a course, in case you don't know how to get yourselves online, we created specifically a course on digital skills for Africa. So you can be able to check it out and be able to get yourselves online. I do want to share that this thesis was published in the um, Advances in Sciences and Arts um, journal by the Malawi University of Science and Technology, which was about exactly 10 days ago. And just by digital promotion, we have 4,000 views and about 200 downloads just because of social media, which I think is what we want to teach you how to be able to do, how to put yourselves out there, because we have to tell our stories as Africa, and that is why we do what we do. Thank you. I'll welcome your questions. So envision the future for Africa. Um, I had a question about the students that you um, interviewed. Yeah. So I think you said you had about 400. And, um, and you talked about how you recruited them. I just wanted a little bit more background information on who those students were and like how, yeah, how you got their, how you got their respondents, what kinds of things you were, what yeah. kinds of information you were collecting from them. All right. Um, I think I actually didn't include the specific question, but I can try to speak about it. Um, so for the respondents, they were different age groups. I think we had um, secondary school level, and then we had university level, and we had, um, I think I had people who were in secondary school, um, tertiary level, and then out of school, like um, working and faculty. Okay. So in terms of approaching them, I put it out first generally on social media to everybody who wanted to. That's people who follow me, who are working in the tech space, because I have a bit of an audience in that space. Then we went directly to schools and we approached them to give us um, the students that were in the computer systems um, and the ones that are from the creation per perspective. So the ones that are studying computer systems and security, business inf information and technology, but also just general students um, overall. And then we went to secondary school level. And these ones, because they're not exactly in the space of creating systems, they were more adopters. So when we had the 461, I think about 363 must have been adopters that users of systems as you'd expect, and then about 63 identified as um, creators of systems. So the 63 were more university level students who are in the universities, but for the, secondary, uh, for the secondary schools, we went through the schools. So it was actually a very interesting data collection because I had to talk to the, um, or to the, um, to the teachers. So they had a computer um, at the school and they would explain the survey to the students that this is what the survey expects you to do. Then they would sit at the computer and do the online form and that's how I was able to collect that data from the students directly. It was very intense, but we managed to. <laughs> yeah. So did you observe any differences yeah. since they were different? With different age groups? Yeah. I think the only difference, the key one, was that some were only uptakers and others were um, the ones that were like the ones that are adopting and the other ones that are creating. In terms of the use of the system, not really because I think my study didn't go specifically into that. Yeah. No further questions? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>